A posthumous birth is when a baby is born after the death of his or her parent. It's something that's almost sure to have psychological implications for both the child and the surviving parent, as we've seen before in Stephen King's Carrie, in the strained relationship between Carrie and her mother. Another example is in Nightmare on Elm Street 5 with Alice and her son Jacob. But there is perhaps no darker an example of the effects of a posthumous birth than in the 2014 horror film The Babadook. The protagonist, a mother named Amelia, loses her husband in a car wreck just before giving birth to her son, Samuel. But something else is born that day, a monster that would become known as the Babadook. To learn about the origins of this icon of modern horror and the part of the ending that nobody's talking about, stick around to the end of this video. This video is sponsored by Factor. Life is not always as it seems. It can be a wondrous thing, but it can also be very treacherous. Welcome to Horror History. If you're watching this video, this horror history lesson, then you probably already know what the Babadook represents. So let's just cut the shit and skip to my conclusion at the end of the video, where I tell you that the Babadook represents the grief of the struggling mother, Amelia. I think everyone already kinda knows that about this movie. It's not gonna be a groundbreaking revelation when I say that at the end of the video. Nobody's mind is gonna be blown. Oh my God, I never looked at it like that. I'm gonna subscribe to this guy. Nah, what I'm more interested for this video is how the Babadook is the embodiment of grief, from the way he behaves to his appearance to the secret lore that you can only get if you have the physical copy of the Mr. Babadook book, the Dook book. The movie is actually an adaptation of writer-director Jennifer Kent's 2005 short film, Monster. It similarly features a single mom of a child named Samuel who is obsessed with fighting monsters. The mother eventually starts seeing the horror for herself. In a 2014 interview with The Cut, Jennifer Kent explained that this character was inspired by a friend of hers who was a single mother whose son was traumatized by a monster figure he thought he saw everywhere in the house, causing Jennifer to imagine what would happen if the monster was real on some level. The monster in the original short film is not named, but the one in the Babadook is, in case you haven't figured that out. While speaking to The Dissolve, Kent said she was staying with a Serbian writer and asked him, what's Serbian for boogeyman? He said Babaroga, but that didn't sound quite right to her, so she changed it to Babadook, and it just felt right. But I think it sounds fucking stupid. As we know, the Babadook represents grief, and grief is often experienced in five stages. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. This is known as the Kubler-Ross model, named after the Swiss psychiatrist Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who identified it. When I first set out to make this video, I assumed that each each stage would present itself chronologically. But what I noticed was that Amelia would often go backwards and demonstrate symptoms of the first four stages multiple times. So I did some more reading and found out that Kubler-Ross never actually intended the stages to be linear. People can experience these aspects of grief at different times and they don't happen in one particular order. But with that in mind, the first stage to present itself in the movie is denial. So to understand the journey of the Babadook, we're gonna take it back to stage one. It all began seven years before the events of the film, when Amelia's husband Oscar was killed while driving her to the hospital to give birth. Instead of facing her trauma, Amelia avoids it. She literally locks all of his stuff up in the basement and forbids her son from going inside, a representation of how she's locking away her grief and refusing to face it. She avoids talking about it and even gets upset when friends or family members broach the subject at all. This essentially gives birth to the Babadook. The Babadook metaphorically grows inside her the longer she tries to deny her trauma. But after years of doing this, it grows too large for her to keep in, and even Samuel takes note of it. In both Monster and the Babadook, Samuel becomes obsessed with killing the monster, with the former inventing homemade contraptions to fight back against it, like a dart gun and a catapult backpack. Both versions are obsessed with protecting their mother from the threat. It's interesting how the absence of a parent causes Sam to want to take on this man of the house kind of role. The short film version of the monster is similar in appearance to the Babadook, with one key difference. The Babadook wears a top hat and a cape, much like Thurston the Great Magician, who Samuel sees as an idol. Sam is an aspiring magician himself, often dressing up like his hero, perhaps the closest thing that the boy has to a father figure in his life. It's likely no mistake that the Babadook takes on a similar form, since Amelia's grief is centered around the loss of a man in the house. A DVD of an illusionist is no proper replacement for a dad. Every year around the time of Samuel's birthday, Amelia's anxiety gets worse. In psychology, this is known as the anniversary effect. This article from the American Psychological Association lists a few healthy coping strats, like recognizing your feelings, finding healthy outlets, remembering and celebrating the lives of loved ones, and using your support system. But since Amelia is still in denial, she doesn't do any of these except for the last one. Each year, they do a joint birthday party for Samuel and his cousin Ruby so that Amelia doesn't have to celebrate on the actual day of Oscar's death. A couple weeks before Samuel's seventh birthday, those feelings rise up again, but Ruby no longer wants to do a joint birthday party. This essentially eliminates Amelia's last line of defense from having to face her trauma, and as a result, the Babadook manifests in the real world for the first time in the form of a book called Mr. Babadook. When Samuel chooses it as a bedtime story, Amelia doesn't know what it is or where it came from. 
If it's in a word or it's in a look, you can't get rid of the Babadook. The text goes on to say, If you're a really clever one and you know what it is to see, then you can make friends with a special one, a friend of you and me. His name is Mr. Babadook, and this is his book. This is telling us that it takes a special person, or a person with a lot of resilience, to learn to live with the grief inside of them, which is what Amelia has to do in this movie. It goes on to explain that the Babadook can be identified by a rumbling sound and three sharp knocks, followed by the croaking of its name. The book also hints at a much more terrifying true form of the Babadook. See him in your room at night, and you won't sleep a wink. I'll soon take off my funny disguise, take heed of what you've read. And once you see what's underneath, you're going to wish you were dead. Samuel is terrified, causing Amelia to put the book away high on top of a dresser, much like how she puts her difficult-to-face feelings out of sight and mind. After this, Samuel's behavior continues to worsen. At first, it appears to be Sam's disobedience that stresses out his mom, but it would soon become apparent that his behavior is actually a result of Amelia's inability to manage her grief, which has an effect on her parenting. When he gets in trouble at school, she insists that she'll talk to him, but we never see that happen, and she continues to avoid conflict. A coworker offers to cover for her at work, and instead of picking up her son, she takes some time to herself before going back to him. When she finally picks him up from her sister's house, she finds that he scared the crap out of Ruby with his antics. Insist on talking to this bloody Babadook thing all day, just talking to the air. There's a confrontation when Samuel insists that the Babadook is real and defiantly spikes a firecracker on the ground. Distracted with her own wallowing, she's completely lost control of her own son. Where did you get those firecrackers? You got them for me on the internet. Well, that's the end of the internet. Okay, bye. The ornery behavior continues, and in her frustration, Amelia begins to experience the second stage of grief, anger. It is August, which means Halloween is coming up, which means I have been so busy. I literally do not know what I would do if I didn't have Factor right now. So Factor is the meal delivery service owned by HelloFresh, another favorite of mine, but Factor is perfect for me right now because start to finish, it is ready in two minutes. You just pop these containers in the microwave and it's ready to eat. But even though they come in containers, it's not like a TV dinner type of deal. It's real, dietitian approved food. And Factor meals are guaranteed fresh and never frozen. They offer 34 plus weekly flavor packed options and you can level up even further with Factor's Gourmet Plus options. Prepared to perfection by chefs, these are the perfect way to treat yourself to upscale meals. So they sent me one of these, and I don't know what the secret is, but the steak doesn't get dry or tough like when you bring home leftovers from a restaurant. It's just perfection. I've gotta go, I'm kinda too busy to do this ad right now, but head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code CZ50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. That's code CZ50 to get 50%. I have so much to do, I'm leaving. Amelia's rage is initially sparked when she catches her son with the key to the basement where all of Oscar's old things are kept. As she tries to put things back in order, she's startled by his old hat and blazer on the coat rack. This shows that the appearance of the Babadook isn't just inspired by the magician, but that Oscar had a similar sense of style and the creature is filling the void of his absence. Samuel's apparent transgressions begin to pile up. Amelia finds glass in her soup, finds the picture of her and Oscar vandalized, with her eyes and mouth made to look kind of like the Babadook, and he even seems to get physically aggressive when she tries to take away his homemade monster fighting weapons. Do you wanna die? Fighting words from someone who is literally three and a half feet tall, but kind of based? The next night, he sees his wardrobe open on its own. We don't find out what happens, but there's a huge thud. Samuel screams, and his mom finds him hyperventilating under the bed, repeatedly saying, don't let it in. While it appears that he's worried about the monster getting into the house, as warned in the storybook, on a subtextual level, he's telling her not to let her dark side get in and take hold of her, something that has obviously happened before. Still not having accepted the existence of the Babadook, Amelia tries to rip up the book and throw it away, which is about as useful as putting Chucky in the trash. The horror always comes back. That night, she hears the three knocks as specified in the book. The toll that the Babadook is taking on her becomes apparent the next day at Ruby's birthday party. Of all of the moms at the party, she's the only one not wearing makeup, and while I don't find makeup to be necessary, I think the implication is that she's the only one who didn't have time to do it. Again, we see her anger slip out in unintended ways when one of the women says that she's been too busy to go to the gym because of her husband's business. I don't even have time to go to the gym anymore, it's ridiculous. That's a real tragedy. Not having time to go to the gym anymore, how do you cope? You must have so much to talk about with those poor disadvantaged women. Wait, where have I seen this before? 
Yep, that's the one. Her outburst makes it seem as though Amelia probably hasn't had the opportunity to exercise in a long time, which is also probably connected to her escalating grief symptoms. This meta-analysis found that exercise during bereavement can have a positive effect on psychological health, and plus, I think we all know that, it's common sense that you feel better when you exercise. Meanwhile, Ruby bullies Samuel for not having a dad, antagonizing him by saying that his dad isn't around because he doesn't want it. This causes Sam to snap. No one wants you. <gasps> Welcome to the kill count. <laughs> I'm so immature. <laughs> During the tantrum on the car ride home, Sam starts screaming at an unseen entity, telling it to get out. It makes sense that he would be able to see the Babadook before her because she has yet to accept that she's the problem. Sam starts convulsing in the back seat, which leads to an emergency doctor's visit where it's concluded that he experienced a febrile convulsion, basically overheating of the brain. The doctor is concerned about his anxiety level, but sees the invention of a monster to be a perfectly normal thing for a child to imagine. However, we know Know that the monster is a metaphor for Amelia's grief, so it's really her mental issues that are causing harm and distress to her own son. A pretty sad situation. The doctor reluctantly supplies her with some sedatives to help Sam sleep at night, just until they can get an appointment with the psychiatrist. This helps her get a much needed rest until the next morning, when she hears the familiar three knocks on her door and looks down to discover the Mr. Babadook book she had discarded with all of the pages pasted back together. It's as the book forewarned, you can't get rid of the Babadook. This time, when she flips through it, there are new pages added onto the end. I'll wager with you, I'll make you a bet. The more you deny, the stronger I get. The next page shows the Babadook terrorizing her in the night. You start to change when I get in. The Babadook growing right under your skin. Oh come, come see what's underneath. This again teases at the idea that what we've seen is not the Babadook's true form. The language seems to playfully reference the magician again. The oh come, come see kind of reminds me of a sort of come one, come all. It's almost time to start the show. I should have done that at the beginning of this episode. I, mean, I, I should, should do, do that, that in all, all my videos. videos. Come one, come all to another episode of horror history. All I need is like the nice uh, Justin Wang mustache. In 2014, a limited number of these books were merchandised. The author is Jennifer Kent, which kind of suggests to me that the content of this book is canon. The movie does show some of these additional pages, but the full context is lost in the cut. There's just no way you're off the hook if you're all grown up and you read this book, and you snub your nose with a civilized look. You'll appeal even more to the big Babadook. The woman in the picture here appears to be Amelia, and this scene of the Babadook frightening her from above would eventually come to happen in the movie. The next page confirms what we already kind of figured out about the monster feeding off of her denial to gain strength. Then, you'll be my puppet, my plaything, my pet. I'll make you do things you'll be sure to regret. To me, this is about the ability for her mental illness to take over her life and basically ruin things for her, which manifests in the Babadook as the power to possess and puppeteer the victim. The following pages show her choking the dog, then her son, before offing herself. There are more pages in the physical book that line up with more of Amelia's story, but I'll come back to that in a little bit. It's at this point that Amelia tries torching the book, but not long after, she receives an ominous phone call uttering the familiar words. She even tries going to the police, but that's not really helpful, seeing as how she just burned the only evidence, and she ends up getting further spooked by this image of a hat and claws on the coat rack at the police station. At home, there are more signs that her sanity is starting to slip. The dog, Pugsy, barks at her and seems to be afraid of her now. The house is a mess, and she discovers a cockroach infestation behind the fridge. And as all these problems are piling up, she's visited by state officials about the well-being of her son, and they see that he's basically mellowed out on sleep medication. For the first time, she sees the Babadook with her own eyes, momentarily standing in her neighbor's house. This not only serves to make Amelia question her own sanity, but it shows that all of her problems are connected. Her mental state caused her to neglect cleaning the house, which led to the appearance of the cockroaches. The neighbor's name is Mrs. Roach, an elderly woman with Parkinson's disease. And the Babadook has cockroach-like qualities. It emits this hissing sound, and in one dream, it can be seen scuttling across the ceiling like a roach. The idea is that Amelia cannot compartmentalize her grief. If she doesn't address it, it's going to affect all aspects of her life. After this dream, she wakes up Samuel and takes him downstairs, clearly starting to fear the Babadook as a real threat for the first time. She finds herself watching a strange old film on TV. This is a real silent film from 1900 called The Magic Book, in which this magician brings the illustrations in this magic book to life. It was directed by French director Georges Méliès, who started his career as a stage magician before getting involved in film. The version that Amelia watches, however, is altered, and she sees the Babadook appear in that book and other old Méliès movie scenes which keeps her awake all night, leaving her sick and exhausted the next morning and setting her up for stage four depression.
Depression is characterized by loss of motivation, loss of interest, and inability to feel pleasure. Amelia climbs into bed and ignores her responsibilities as a mother, even when Samuel tells her that he feels sick from the sleeping pills and needs food. She sees his cries for help as an annoyance and lashes out at him with anger, and after realizing what she's done, finds him in a fetal position on the floor. She attempts to make up for it by taking him to his favorite restaurant, but the booth next to theirs is celebrating a birthday, a looming reminder about Sam's own birthday and the anniversary of Oscar's death. She decides to take him for a long drive afterwards, but suddenly sees roaches in her lap and the image of the Babadook tailing their car. This causes her to swerve and crash the vehicle, and in a panic, runs from the scene of the incident. She's spiraling further and further out of control. When she gets home, she plunges back into her depression, clinging to the things that comfort her. She sits in the warm bathtub in her clothes, not doing anything, and goes to sleep with Oscar's old violin. Even Sam begins to fear her, and attempts to call Mrs. Roach to see if he can stay over there instead, but when she catches him, she cuts the phone line to prevent him from embarrassing her any further. You know, Amelia, usually the bad guy is the one to do that, but go ahead, knock yourself out. Actually, it kinda tracks, considering that the Babadook is just a manifestation of her grief. In a way, she is the bad guy of this story, and the conflict is the internal struggle she's having against herself. Her role is a lot like Jack Torrance from The Shining. Both characters started with good intentions, but are consumed by their afflictions to become the villain and it wouldn't be long before the monster's promise of making her his puppet would become a reality. She still insists that the Babadook isn't real, another clear-cut example of her denial, and she makes a huge scene out of closing and locking all the windows. The cycle of treating Sam with cruelty to pampering him continues through the night until she's lured out of the living room by the illusion of her son sleepwalking into the basement. When she arrives there, she's shocked to see her late husband, Oscar. Bargaining is described as the defense mechanism you go through to fight against the feeling of helplessness during a loss. It's essentially the series of what-if scenarios you may go through in your head to try to cope with that which you cannot control. Maybe you've experienced this to some degree. If I hadn't said those things, maybe we wouldn't have broken up. Or if I worked longer hours, they wouldn't have let me go. For Amelia, the bargaining stage happens in a very direct way, with her coming face to face with her deceased loved one and him literally making her an offer. You can be together. You just need to bring me the boy. The part of her subconscious responsible for seeing Oscar still feels that if they never had a child, she never would have lost her husband. But when she refuses to offer up her son, he recedes into the darkness, later emerging from the kitchen with the insectile hiss scaring her away to the bedroom. Wherever she goes, she's unable to avoid her trauma and it comes down through the chimney where it finally gets her and takes over her body. The book warned that it would make her do things she'd regret, and that's exactly what happened. The dog comes downstairs as she's watching a movie, and she chases him down and snaps his neck in the kitchen. She hasn't been a good mom up to this point, but this is by far the most reprehensible thing she does. Her anger goes unchecked, and to signify this, we see her pull out her tooth, which we'd seen her grinding throughout the movie as her anger grew. After noticing Samuel spying from the top of the stairs, she chases after him, and he locks himself away in his room, causing her to turn into something almost demonic as she climbs the wall trying to kick in the door and screams, let me in, the same phrase used by the Babadook in the children's book. Speaking of that book, after scaring him with it for the first time, she had to calm him down by reading him a fairy tale, and she uses similar tactics here. You little pig. Six years old and you're still wetting yourself. By calling him a little pig, she's calling back to the big bad wolf story that she read him earlier. Funny enough, I made the Jack Torrance comparison earlier, and he too used the big bad wolf to taunt his own victims. Little pigs. Little pigs. Let me come in, not by the hair on your chinny chin chin. Then I'll huff, and I'll puff, and I'll blow your house in. Samuel throws a firecracker at her feet to try to escape, and she mockingly sings. Run, 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 as fast as you can. Another fairy tale reference. The chase would go on for a while longer, including an interruption from a concerned Mrs. Roach, and it would end with Sam, who has nowhere else to run, striking his mom and knocking her out. I guess his fighting words earlier were not so unwarranted after all. This kid's the real deal. When she awakes, she finds herself in one more fairy tale like scenario, tied down with rope in the basement like the giant in Gulliver's Travels. I think the references to all these fairy tales are to highlight how the Babadook draws upon elements from fairy tales, which often contain moral lessons and allegorical elements, which is what we're supposed to be looking for here as well. And it seems by this point, Sam very much understands the true nature of the Babadook because he says this. <sighs> don't love me. The Babadook won't let you, but I love you, Mum, and I always will. You let it in! You have to get it out! Her hands get free, and the Babadook forces her to strangle her own son, but she seems to get a hold over herself and vomits out a black substance, essentially expelling the creature's control over her body. And while this is a good first step, Sam reminds her, you can't get rid of the Babadook. And then he's aerated up the stairs. 
Apes. I still remember seeing this movie for the first time in 2014 and rolling my eyes when I saw this. I think this was actually the first time that I ever coined this as a common phenomena in horror movies. I don't know if I called it air yeeting yet. I'm not sure if yeet had entered the lexicon at that point, but I definitely had seen The Conjuring and Carrie and Insidious 2 the previous year, and I was pretty sick of seeing characters get pulled out of thin air in every horror movie. And The Babadook was just the one that broke me, because it didn't need to do that. There seems to be a lot of talk about the Babadook being so intelligent and elevated, but really when you break it down, it's the same flickering lights, creepy phone calls, possession, black vomit, moving furniture, and air yeeting that was going on in every paranormal movie at the time. I'm not a Babadook hater, I like that there's substance to the movie, but don't act like it reinvented the genre or anything. Also, this one air yeet is kind of funny. I'm so immature. As the bed starts shaking, Amelia screams into the dark void on the other side of the room, asking, what do you want? For the first time, she acknowledges the creature as something more than a figment of her son's imagination. And in doing so, she acknowledges the problem growing inside of her. And this takes her to... Once more, Oscar emerges from the shadows. This time, he begins repeating his lines from right before the car crash, and Amelia is forced to see and live through the tragedy all over again. But this time, instead of going straight into denial, she gets mad and confronts the monster festering in the darkness. If you touch my son again, I'll kill you! Yeah, don't ever talk to me or my son again! Although it seems to have reached its final form, her ferocity seems to weaken the Babadook, and it shrinks back into the darkness, leaving only the hat and jacket, which fall to the floor. Upon touching these clothing articles, the entity screeches at her, scampers down to the basement, and locks itself in. And from this point, although she seems to have overcome the Babadook, that's far from the whole story. <laughs> I withheld the rest of the story from the physical Babadook book until now for probably the same reason that the end of the book is never shown in the film. It would kinda spoil it. You cannot get rid of me. Dare to look me in my face. Try to put me in my place. I will cause you so much strife, but you might just get out with your life. Whether adult or child, best to give me a home. Put the welcome mat out with a room of my own. And accept that I'm here and from you I have grown. Keep me smaller in size, I might leave you alone. I only said might. You can't get rid of the Babadook, so the only solution is to learn to live with it in a healthy way. After that final night, we see Amelia attempting to do just that. She explains to the social workers that they celebrated Sam's birthday on the actual day for the first time, only now she's being very transparent about why they never did it before. She can also be seen planting black roses, a universal symbol of mourning, in the backyard over where the dog is now buried. Which shows us that this time, she's dealing with the grief head on, instead of avoiding it like she did for seven years with Oscar. Her and Sam collect a bowl of worms from the spot, and she instructs him to stay inside while she takes the bowl into the basement where the Babadook is locked up, and seemingly feeds him using the bowl of worms. The short film, Monster, has a similar ending, where the mother periodically feeds the monster a glass of milk to keep it satiated. So what is the significance of the switch to worms as the snack of choice for the Babadook. I think it has to do with the journey that Amelia has gone through to reach this point. During the climax, no, not that climax. She was so far gone that she killed her dog and nearly her son. If you look closely, the worms are picked right from above the dog's gravesite, so she seems to be using them as a motivation to keep her grief in check by taking some time to acknowledge it every now and then so it doesn't grow and fester into a monster that she cannot control. Amelia never fully defeats the Babadook, but this is a good first step towards taking some of its power and making it more manageable. The film as a whole plays as a very lonely, isolating experience because only her and the son encounter it. If you're not living in that house, it would be difficult to ever truly understand. Jennifer Kent's next movie, The Nightingale, also features a mother who loses her husband and baby at the beginning of the movie, and she sets out for revenge. Like the Babadook, there's no real catharsis, there's only learning to better deal with the circumstances at hand. Amelia is at the beginning of a road to healing, a road that there is no guarantee she'll make it down. But just as Amelia's battle is not over, neither is your viewing session. I've got more <laughs> horror history analyses lined up in that playlist on the left. Remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring the death bell for all notifications, and I'll see you in the next one. Assuming we both survive.